Right, so welcome everyone to this uh, session. We're going to talk today about, um, let me just, if I face off the screen. Right, so we're going to talk today about owning your Scopus author profile, um, which is also about like get, getting the most out of your author profile when you are using Scopus. So before we get started, um, so you will uh, of course have noticed that everybody has been muted and uh, you can ask your questions using the Q&A uh, box. Uh, we are recording the session and we will make all the slides and the recording available uh, after the session. So it is also important to let you know that uh, one day after today, so in, within 24 hours, you will receive an email from Zoom, automatically from Zoom, one day after the after today, um, that will give you information about how you can download your uh, certificate. So in the past week, there was a uh, an issue with the website where the certificates um, are held, uh, but this has been corrected. So the certificates are now available and you can see already 1,769 people have downloaded their certificates. Um, so I, there were two emails about this. Uh, you have been notified um, to go to this website um, and to download your, your uh, certificate. The same will happen with this recording. So one day after today, you will receive an email with information how to download your certificate. So this uh, session that we have today is part of a series of Scopus sessions. Um, we are today going to talk about Scopus also profile. And just to remind you, next week, uh, there will be a, a session about the Scopus journal metrics. So please join us again and remember um, the, all the, um, the sessions that are going to follow on, on this one. So for today, we're going to cover quite a lot of information. We're going to just quickly, uh, you know, give an overview of Scopus as always. And then we're going to talk about why are uh, author profiles important? Also, how are author profiles created in Scopus? How can you correct your, your, your author profile? How do you find author profiles? What are the different components of the author profile? And then what type of analysis can you do in author profiles? Keeping track of your, of your profile, as well as new features that we have added to the author profile. So quite a lot of information that we are covering today. So before we get there, for those that are not aware, what is Scopus? So Scopus is a global multidisciplinary database for discovering academic literature, and it includes visualization tools that allow you to also analyze your search results as well as it provides metrics to measure research performance. So in terms of what the coverage of Scopus is, there are more than 7,000 publishers that provide us with their publications. Um, that is about 27.1 thousand serials or journal titles that are indexed in Scopus. In total, we have now almost, or we have more than 90 million items in Scopus. What is important is that each of these items are linked to an affiliation profile. So who wrote the article as well as, uh, or uh, you, who wrote the article in terms of the author, author profile, and then also which institution is that author with, right? So every publication mapped to, to the uh, affiliation and to the author who contributed to that to that publication, right? So Scopus covers an, a large number or quite a number of use cases. So you can use Scopus uh, to find journals. You can use Scopus to track and assess a researcher's impact through their citations. You can find people to collaborate with other researchers working in the same topic. You can track impact. Um, you can find the most current uh, research. And you can also determine how to differentiate research topics. Today, we're going to fo focus specifically on the researcher, on, the, on the, uh, the author profile. So it's very specific use case that we're focusing on today. 
Uh, it is important to know that Scopus's coverage is uh, multidisciplinary in the sense that it covers broadly physical sciences, health sciences, social sciences, and life sciences. Um, and it also covers different types of documents, so journals and conference proceedings and books and patents, right? So it's not only journal articles. Uh, conferences specifically is very well covered in Scopus. More than almost 12 million conference papers are um, available within Scopus. Um, we also have articles in press, which means that for about almost 9,000 journals, we also make available articles when they have been accepted. So they haven't been published yet, but they have been accepted. So the publishers send us this information and we make it available in Scopus. So that makes Scopus very current uh, uh, and uh, it is updated daily. So there's about 12,000 articles that are added to Scopus every day. For indexing uh, of journals within Scopus, it goes through a selection criteria process. So journals that we index in Scopus have to apply to be indexed. And then we look at the quality of the journal before it is decided that the journal can be indexed. And that is a very rigorous process with about 46% of, of, of journals being accepted after they've been reviewed, not by Scopus itself, but by a content selection and advisory board that is independent of Scopus because they have, and they have um, um, subject uh, experts that make the decisions for us, right? So that brings us to, at the moment, Scopus covering. So this is a little bit outdated. So Scopus covering about 27,000 active journals at the moment. So that represents um, almost half of all the peer-reviewed uh, journals that are available uh, worldwide. So what is important also is that Scopus is not used only by institutions and by individual researchers. It's also used by, um, by countries on a government level. So, uh, and also organizations like the OECD, they use the Scopus data to get a sense and they do analysis on what is the research performance on a country level or on a subject level. Uh, so it's very much used for national research assessment, and it's also used by the large ranking organizations, right? So Times Higher Education Ranking, QS Ranking, they use Scopus data to give information to the public about what is the state or what is the, the quality of research within different institutions. And this is also why it is important for us to understand that, you know, our, our um, author profiles, because all of this information is used not only on a local level, but on a national level and on a global level. So having accurate information in Scopus is quite important. So what we're going to talk to about today is the Scopus author profiles. How I hope this is already familiar to you. Um, this is what the, the author profile looks like. So you can see the name of the author, the, uh, the, the author, the institution, um, some information about the publications and the citations, the topics. Um, and this is what we're going to delve into in you know more deeply um, in today's session. So why are author profiles useful? So that's the, the first and the, the first topic uh, of today, or the first point that we're going to talk about today. So on the left-hand side, it shows here that it is important, Scopus is useful for the researcher in terms of showcasing their work. It is a way of showing the entire researcher ecosystem about what you are working on, what you are publishing, and this is useful then for uh, for on an on a institutional level, for the institution to know about you, also for funding organizations to know about you, and for other researchers to know about you. But Scopus is also used in the reverse, in, in a reverse way, where, the, where uh, other researchers will be looking at your profile to see whether you are somebody that they would like to work with. 
and funding organizations when you apply for funding for your research will also look at what is your Scopus profile saying about what the research is that you are doing. Um, and then the same is for your know, research administration where the institution or the country is trying to keep track of what the researchers in the institution or in the country is uh, working on, just to get a sense of what the state of research is uh, within a specific environment. Right, so this is the value then of author profiles. It is used, it is valuable for you as a researcher, but it is also valuable for other entities to look at what research you are focusing on and whether it is um, something that they would want to reach out to you about. So importantly, you know, to be able to use your author profile in Scopus usefully or optimally, I think it's a good idea to know how they are, how they are created. And Scopus profiles are built from documents. So every document or publication that comes into Scopus is matched to the author. And it's also matched, matched to the affiliation, which I have mentioned to you. So uh, all your publications will be match, will be linked to you as an author. And then it will be also distributed between the different institutions at which you work. Right. So your author profile will always contain all your publications, but if you are working between two institutions, some of them will be matched to institution A and some of them will be matched to institution B. And this matching is done by an algorithm. So for every incoming article, uh, a temporary profile is created for the researcher. Um, and then it tries to match to find who is that researcher based on the information that is on the document. So it will use the name, the publication um, year, it will use the co-authors and it will try to match with a profile. It will also look at the affiliation of the researcher, what is the email, what keywords are, are being used because researchers typically, they work within a specific subject areas. So it looks at a number of parameters that the, the, the um, you know, the algorithm looks at a number of parameters and tries to match on any of those parameters to see whether this document belongs to this researcher. As soon as it can make a, a match, uh, then the temporary profile becomes a, a single author, author profile and your publication is matched to an author profile and it captures your information. So the information about your name, which institution you are, uh, the subject area that you're publishing in, and uh, et cetera, all the information that we can find on, on the publication. So this then is how the author profile is created using this algorithm. Right. So the author, the author profile is basically a two-step a two-step process where the first part of the author profile is that it is automatically created. Um, so using that algorithm method, that's the first step in the process. The second step in the process is the responsibility of you as the researcher to make sure that the algorithm is correct. Right? So the algorithm is a machine. So by you as a researcher, you can check whether the algorithm is doing its work and whether your publications are correctly linked to your author profile. So it's a two-step process where one part is done by the algorithm and the second part is your responsibility. So this is quite different from you know, other systems for, for where, where everything, uh, where you have to create your own author profile from, you know, from scratch. So you have to register, you have to give information about who you are, and then you have to find your articles in Google Scholar or wherever they are, um, ResearchGate, and then you have to link them to your profile that you have created. So this is not necessary in Scopus. Scopus does this automatically. Your only job is you must check that the, that the algorithm um, is doing its work um, in, in, in the right way. Uh, so we have a very high accuracy, but I will also mention some of the difficulties um, 
which uh, we come across, uh, which makes it important to also get your input. So this is exactly why. So how can you, how can profiles be corrected? And so why do we need some feedback in some cases? Why is the algorithm not always 100% um, accurate? Is that there is a variation in the metadata that we receive from the publishers. So every publisher has a specific way in which they uh, want authors to provide their information. And we get, the, we get that information, not from the author, but from the publisher. And so there are differences with the publishers. And then also authors um, uh, with high frequency names publishing in the same field, same institution and same department. So those authors, if they are different, but they look the same because they are in the same field and their name is the same and they have the same institution, that might become confusing for the algorithm and difficult for the algorithm to match. So it can also be because an, a, an author changes the field in which they publish. So this can also confuse the algorithm. So if you usually publish in social science and now you write a paper and you publish it in a computer science journal, that will be confusing. So that might um, lead to some difficulty or an incorrect uh, linking. It could also be that the author has moved to another affiliation. Uh, it can be that, especially amongst women, it can happen when their last name um, changes when they get married. It can also happen when author publishes with a name variant. So even authors themselves, they don't use their names consistently. You know? So sometimes I will be Lucia Scumbi, sometimes I will be L Scumbi, sometimes I will be L C Scumbi. So sometimes they use their initials, sometimes full name, and that the name variants are, are different and it makes it difficult, more difficult for the algorithm to match. Um, there are also some variations in the affiliation name. So you can imagine some authors, they use the acronym of the institution where they are working. Sometimes they use the full name, sometimes the acronym. Sometimes they don't even use the name. They only use the name of the department or of the uh, lab or of the center where they are working. So this, this is incomplete information and is a difficult thing to do an accurate uh, matching. So the message here is for authors to be as consistent as possible in terms of how you write your name and how you write the name of your affiliation. So what the types of corrections that can be made on an author profile is that you can do a merging of, of two author profiles because what happens in Scopus is if the algorithm cannot match up to about 98% accuracy, it will create another author profile for you. So sometimes you will go into Scopus and you will see two author profiles for the same person. That happens when the algorithm was not able to match at about 98% um, accuracy. Um, so there are two and then there's an option within Scopus, which I will show you, where you can then yourself merge those two profiles. You can also split a split, split off the articles from one author profile to another author profile. So sometimes it will happen where there are two authors that have very similar name. Um, so it, it will confuse the two names and it would put all articles into the same um, you know, author profile. So you can also split that. Um, and there could also be some detailed mistakes. So the information we get from the publisher. Um, so you can make a correction on your name, on the email address, or on the author profile itself, right? So any kind of details where we maybe got the incorrect information from the publisher that can be corrected. And if you look at your author profile and there's something, an article that you published and you were expecting to see it there, but it's not there, you can also search for that article uh, in Scopus. And if you find it maybe linked uh, to someone else, you can claim the article for yourself. So you can add missing content to your author profile. 
So how do you do these kinds of edits when you go to the author profile? Um, it looks like, you know, on the right hand side here in this box, you will, you have your name and then under your institution, there will be an option edit profile. So clicking on the edit profile, it will take you to a wizard. Um, so if you click on that wizard also, it will give you some more information. And in the wizard, there are options that you can change. So you can tell the... Um, you can tell Scopus what is the preferred format of your name, right? So in this case, we have uh, Dudna Jennifer A. Uh, you can change that to Dudna Jenny A or whatever you prefer as your name, but it must be one of the options that you have already used in Scopus, right? So if you click on this preferred name on the down arrow, it will give you other name options that you have already used and you can select the one that you prefer. So you can't add a new one, but you can select from all the different variants that there are, the one that you like the most. You can also remove content. So when you look at documents, you, it will give you a list of all your articles. And if there is something that is linked to your profile that shouldn't be there, it's somebody else's article, you can mark it as, um, you know, that it must be removed. And you can also give feedback on new content types um, or on new articles. So you can look for missing content that should be linked to your profile, but is not linked to your profile. You can look for that. Um, in Scopus, if it's not in Scopus, that's a different problem. That might be that we didn't receive it from the publisher and you can report it by going to the um, Scopus support. Let us see if there's a, a, it's not an option yet, but anywhere where you see a question mark, click on that and there's an option where you can um, you, you report any kind of query. Um, so you can also give feedback. So there's a feedback um, option on this um, on this wizard as well. Um, so another way that you can do some some corrections is that when Scopus is not a hundred percent certain whether some documents belong to you, they will put your documents under a potential author match. Right. So. They keep track of all the author names that come into Scopus. And if they think that it's, they're not sure, but they think that it might be um, on linked to another name, you can click on the potential author names to make sure whether, uh, you know, Scopus has another name for you that it's using, right? So potential author matches is another way um, that you can find um, information about your author profile. And if your name is, is there, then you can just, you know, claim those, those publications for yourself. So these are the different ways on how you can request um, a correction on your, on your author profile. So firstly, by doing, going to the edit profile. And then secondly, to complete the wizard, the wizard is going to ask you questions. You can complete the wizard. And then you can also click on potential author matches to make sure that the algorithm didn't accidentally miss one of your publications um, and put it under a potential name. So one of the ways that you can also then, um, you know, make a correction on your author profile is to request to merge with an author. So here you can see we've got two researchers, Dudna John H and Dudna J. And these are actually the same people. They are at, they are in engineering is the subject. They are at California independent uh, system systems. And it's, you can see it's the same city, the same, same country. It's, basically the same person and you can just by selecting each of the names you can select that and then there's an option request to merge authors right. so you can do this kind of you can make this kind of merging of author profiles in this case you can also see um, that it seems like there's a researcher that has had a name change a complete name change 
uh, which is also possible. It's not common, but it's possible. And you can also then claim uh, this. So the, 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 the uh, a Scopus affiliation team will keep an eye on this. So they will also check uh, whether when you claim other publications for your author profile, that it makes sense and that it does belong to you. Um, so they have got ways of also checking to make sure uh, that you are not claiming anybody else's publications. If you do that, then the other person is going to also notice that, of course. So if you claim somebody else's papers, then it's taken away from their author profile, added to your profile for everybody to see. Um, so it's not, you know, it doesn't make sense to do that because the 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 real author is going to obviously notice that you you've claimed um, their their publications. So one of the biggest problems that we have within Scopus is that there are many researchers that have the same name, but who are not the same person. So you can have many Dr. Smiths, you can have many Muhammad Ibrahims, or you can have many of you know, researchers that have exactly the same name. Um, and so it is difficult for the algorithm then to distinguish between researchers that have the same name or very, very similar names. And therefore, um, we encourage then users, uh, any uh, researcher uh, to use ORCID. So ORCID is almost like, you know, every book has an ISBN number. And every journal has an ISSN number. It's an international number that is uniquely identifying that journal or that, um, or that book. So we have the same system also for researchers. So instead of using your name as your identifier, as your unique ID, you can use a number, a unique numerical um, you know, code can represent your author, your authorship, basically. And how you do that is that within Scopus, there's an option where you can click on, um, you know, link to ORCID, and then you can claim your ID number, your ORCID number, which is an international numerical number, which represents you uniquely. And this helps the algorithm not to confuse you with other researchers that have a very similar name as you. Right. Um, so I, I will show you, you that when we get uh, when we do that live. But what it basically entails is that uh, when you click on that link, it will take you to the ORCID website. You must register on that website. Uh, then the website will give you this long number. Um, starting with four zeros and then zero, 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 two. So it gives you a number which is uniquely your number to identify yourself um, uh, alternatively to using just your name. And then the next step in ORCID, ORCID is you can also import all your um, publications that are in Scopus. You can import into ORCID. And ORCID is like a profiling system on itself, in itself, where you can, you know, also you can have all your publications, you can have, um, you know, what the projects are that you're working on. So you can add even your own information into ORCID. Um, and you can use then Scopus and ORCID side by side. But the value, the most important value of ORCID is that it it helps the algorithm to identify you uniquely if you have a similar name than somebody else. Right, so finding author profiles. Though there are in Scopus two ways of finding authors. Then the one is doing an author profile search um, and the other is by doing a, 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 a search in the author field. Um, and this gives you two different types of results. So if you do an author profile search, the search engine is going to give you um, options of author profiles. So you will see a list of the author profiles that we have available. 
if you do a search in the author field, it will return to you in your search results the documents that have your name on it. So not your author profile, but the documents that have your name on. So it's completely, it looks, it looks different. The search uh, basically um, looks different. So I think at this stage, let me just go into Scopus itself and show you what I mean. So here I'm on the Scopus homepage and I said, you can do us an author search. So if you click on author and you type in a name, so we, we can see, look for Elon Musk. You see if he's an Elon Musk, we can see if Elon Musk is an author in Scopus, we search. And we can see, yes, Elon Musk is an author. He has 22 publications. He has an H index of one. So you see the results that we find is that um, is, is an author, is a list of authors. If you go back and you search um, in the author field, let me just find an author field. And you say, or not. You will see a list of documents. You know, now you see the documents. Um, so maybe he's using different name variants. You can just use my. Oh, so there are other authors also with the name of Musk. But the difference is here you get a list of documents, you don't get a list of authors, right? So that's the difference in terms of using, when you use the author search option, then you will, and you type in Musk, first the last name and then the full name. And in Scopus, when we have the information, the full name, we always add the full name. So you don't only have to use the initials, you can use the full name. So you will see here we get a, 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 an author name. And if we look at now, what are the, what does the author profile consist of? Right. So in the first instance, you can see we've got the name of the author. Then we've got the affiliation. So uh, Elon Musk has been linked to different affiliation. So um, he's, he's lost and the, the, the last affiliation that you use will always be the one that will be appearing um, under your name, right? So if you go to edit profile, you can change this. So let me just, I'm not going to change anything, but just to show you. So this was the last affiliation that he used when he published. But he is also linked to Tesla, of course. So if he wants Tesla to be uh, the name that is shown or the affiliation that is shown on his, on his profile, he can choose that one. He can also choose of all the different ways in which his name was used, which one does he prefer? So you can't add a new option, but you can select one of the options that are already captured in Scopus. So let me just go back to the full author profile. So the first thing that you see in your author profile is your name, your affiliation, a unique Scopus ID, which is created. And then here is your option to connect to Orchid. And Orchid is the option that will give you, um, that will allow you to create that unique numerical ID for your researcher, for your researcher profile. Um, so I won't do this. Uh, Elon Musk needs to do this himself if he wants to, um, but or any other, or, you know, or researcher that is something that you have to do yourself because you have to um, register on the Orchid website to be able to do this. Then it gives you more information here. So it will tell you what is your institution history, which institution were you publishing at, at what time, or what year, um, and it will also give you the subject areas. So often researchers publish in a multidisciplinary 
when they publish in multidisciplinary journals, then it looks like this because they, you know, the journals cover a lot of subjects um, at the same time. But basically, it captures all the subject areas that you are publishing in via the journal that you selected in which you published. Right. So this is all information about your name and your affiliation. And then we get to your number of documents that you published. And these documents can be articles, conference papers, book chapters, uh, all, all the different types of, of, of documents that we have. How many times was it cited? So you have your total citation count. Where did those citations come from? They came from 619 documents. So some of these documents cited uh, in more than once um, and then or were cited more than once. And then you can see the H index, right? So the H index is basically a metric that tells you something about the number of publications and the number of citations of a researcher. And it shows you how it's calculated. So it's not a, it's not a mathematical equation. It's just an indicator. So it shows you, you list, all your publications are listed in a descending order by the number of citations that you receive. So your, so your article, with the most citations is at the top is number one. Second most citations is number two. And where the rank order, the rank order of your publications by the number of um, citations matches uh, or is, is more than your number of publications, then that constitutes your H index, right? So, Elon Musk has published eight publications that have more than eight citations, but his ninth, um, his ninth publication only has six. So that's why his H index is not nine, it's, six, it's eight, because um, the number of citations that he has for his eighth publication or his eighth publication is more than, um, is more than eight. Right. So this is also shown here on the on a graph where your publications are, are your publications are listed by the number of citations. The highest one was 292. And this is just your uh, number, your number of publications, and where the two overlap is uh, that constitutes your H index. Right. So Scopus automatically calculates that for you, but it's also useful to understand, you know, how that works. What is the methodology behind that? Um, Scopus then also shows you some overview information about your publication. So for Elon Musk, his first publication was in 2003. It didn't get much, you know, citations. And then he published again in 2008 years 2013 and 14 and it's only when he gets here to, to 2021 and he published I think it was on something on COVID then he started he published five documents and you can see the number of citations was 167. So this little histogram gives you information that shows your publications relative to to your citations. And then you also find information about that you can analyze your author output. So if you click on the on the author output, you see information about you know what subject areas are you publishing in, uh, what is the type of publications that you publish, um, is it more reviews, is it notes, is it conference papers. Um, so for Elon Musk, thirteen of his publications were articles. You can see by year and and so on. Uh, so it gives you uh, some analysis of, uh, of how your publishing profile looks like and then also who are your co-authors um, and, and how many publications did you co-author with each of those authors. Right? So going back then to the types of analysis that you can do. So you can get that author output, uh, that, that, you know, that analysis and then what researchers often also want to see is the citation overview because this is very interesting for them to see all their publications. So he's got 22 publications, but say we can look at them 
and it shows you one by one when they were published and when they were cited. So this was published, this is uh, most recent publication was published in 22 and it was cited 29 times. In, in, in 2022, and it was cited eight times this year in 2023. So in total, it has 37. The subtotal is 37, and the total is 37, right? So what this means above here is the, the screen is too small to show, you know, all the, all the citations that go back to, say, 2003. So it is subtotaling up to 2019. And then it shows the number of citations for each year after 2019. And then it subtotals the citations and gives you a total. But in essence, what, what is useful for researchers to see is then um, you know, for each of their publications. So this is making humans a multi-planetary species that was written in 2017. It was cited. Um, 23 times in 2019 or before 2019 and then in 2019 13 times and you can go and see who cited your articles right so this is interesting because you can also reach out to these researchers and you can collaborate with them so in your profile you can see an overview a citation overview of all your publications so that's a very useful thing. Very difficult to find if you don't have Scopus. Then Scopus also tells you in what subject areas or what topics are you contributing. So topics is a, um, is a different methodology where publications are grouped together, not because not on keywords, but because there are cite, there's a citation density between them. Um, so these authors are citing each other and, and that group of publications um, that they are all citing each other is then, is then given a name and the name is then a few keywords. So this is the first topic. Um, so, he, or, you know, he's not only publishing about engineering, but he's also publishing things about COVID-19. Um, uh, so he's also publishing in a topic called Amplifier Front End uh, CMOS, um, and he's also publishing in a topic uh, that is about weightlessness, aerospace medicine, etc. Right. So this is just a summary for every author. This is given. Um, if Scopus can identify, um, you know, which topic you are focusing on, it will show that. Uh, information on your on your author profile and then below this part you will see uh, then a summary of your of your documents where you can see each of them you can open them you can see how many times they were cited you can sort them all of that you can also see who cited you so you can um, you know open up all those publications and then something new that we added to to Scopus recently of preprints. So, so the preprints are not integrated in the entire Scopus, but we show on an author level if an author has got publications in one of our one of the big um, preprint servers. So archive, biochive, um, SSRN, there are large preprint servers that we cover about, I, I can't remember now, six or, or eight um, large preprint. And a preprint is basically a manuscript or the findings of your research um, before it has been peer reviewed, right? Uh, so it is, it is usually used when researchers want to get their work, um, um, you know, public as quickly as possible. If they, know, if they think they have important results that they want to share with other researchers quickly, um, they don't, and they don't have time to wait for publication, wait for preprint, or while they're waiting for the for the peer review, they can make it available as a preprint in a preprint server, uh, which we then also capture um, and we we sh and and we show this as well. So here are some of the um, servers that we are covering: archive, biochive, chemchive, medchive, SSRN. 
TechRIVE and so on. So these are all some of the major um, you know, preprint servers. So important to remember that the preprints um, are for interest, but they have not been um, peer reviewed. So they are also not included when we calculate any metrics. So when we calculate, um, say for instance, the H index, um, where's the H index now? Um, so here's the H index. So when we calculate the H index, we don't take into consideration the preprint um, because Scopus in principle actually only covers peer reviewed publications. So the final thing that I want to show what is important about the, um, the author profile is also that you can um, set an alert. So for your own, for your own author profile, if you want to make sure to get a notification when a publication has been linked to your author, author profile, you can set an alert um, and you can say Scopus must look out for any uh, publication with Elon Musk and it must send you an email every week on a Tuesday so that you can know when articles have been added to your author profile or you can select any other author profile. If you want to follow your supervisor and see what he's publishing, or if you have an important author that is important in your field and you want to know when they publish anything new, set up an alert so that you can find a notification about uh, when any new publications are added to the author profile. Right. So this is an this is then um, in conclusion, this is what the author profile looks at very rich in information um, about your publication behavior, the number of publications, the number of time it's been cited, who are you co-authoring with, um, you know, which institutions have you worked at, uh, which topics are you covering, and then awarded grants is something that we're not well covering in Africa, so it's mostly in the US and Canada, um, and then uh, information about each of those we just go back to the documents. So it gives you, in, you can actually look at each of these documents. You can print this and, and take a you know, deeper look at any of, of them. Right, so let me just make sure that I've covered everything. Yeah, so with that, just go back to my slides. Um, Oh, there is one thing that I did not show you, and this is that when you do search for an author, so you've done a search for a specific author, it is also possible then to, um, so you search, let me just go back, it's about on this level, when you do an author search, and you want to capture, Say you want to capture all the publications of Elon Musk and you say a save to author list, right? So there's an option that you can save to author list. Um, and you can create a, a list um, and you can say something like you want to keep track of um, tick billionaires um, and save the list. And then you go and you search for say, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So any, any uh, group of authors that you are interested in to analyze their work. Um, so then you can select Mark Zuckerberg. He's published 10 publications in Scopus. And you can also add his publications to the tech billionaires. And then you save that list. And if you go back to your saved author lists, if you click on tech billionaires, it will give you a list um, it will show you which authors are in that list. You can add more authors. You can put Bill Gates there and whoever. And then you can analyze combined. What do uh, you know? What does their publications look like combined as a group? So as a group, um, 
Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk have published 32 publications and they have an H index of 11. So 11 of their publications have been cited 11 times and you can see more information about that, right? So this is an, a new feature that we brought into the Scopus authors where you can um, save a list of um, different authors' publications into one list and then you can analyze that list of publications, right? So that is quite um, useful. And with that, then I am done. And in terms of just sharing you with you some, you know, how do you keep up to date with Scopus? We have a newsletter, we have a blog, we have Twitter. You can sign up for any of these services. Um, I've already covered that. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that was useful for you. Um, if there are any questions, um, please uh, let me know. Let's go back to Scopus homepage. Surya, are there any questions for me? Uh, yes, Lucia, but uh, many questions was uh, answered uh, during your presentations. Uh, so I will give some uh, global answer for those who, okay. are, who are asking about the uh, recording uh, and uh, certification. Donc, je donnerai une réponse globale aux toutes les personnes qui s'interrogent sur la manière d'avoir l'enregistrement. Donc, euh, l'enregistrement euh, est inclus dans euh, le lien qui vous est envoyé pour récupérer l'attestation. Une fois que vous cliquez dessus, ça vous oriente vers Research Academy. Euh, vous répondez sur le le un petit euh, questionnaire et après vous avez après vous avez accès vous devez d'abord vous connecter à votre compte Research Academy en utilisant si vous l'avez votre profil euh, votre compte d'accès à Scopus vous allez télécharger trouver en bas à droite le lien vers l'attestation le lien vers euh, l'enregistrement pour le visualiser sinon vous si vous voulez le télécharger, en haut à droite, il y a le lien pour télécharger tout le contenu de, de, du webinaire, y compris le support, euh, la présentation PowerPoint et l'enregistrement. Donc, c'est comme ça que vous pouvez récupérer l'enregistrement le, et le support. Il y, a, euh, il y a une autre question sur le volume horaire. Euh, le chapitre... Mm. Euh, Uh, many participants are requesting uh, to mention the uh, how many hours spent in the webinar. If you can add it in the f in the future uh, certificate, that will be uh, great because uh, uh, it's uh, highly uh, recommended. Okay, welcome. Thank I you. will do that. Yes. Donc voilà, la 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 requête est transmise à Lucia qui va euh, mettre à jour les informations des attestations pour inclure le volume euh, horaire. Il euh, y a une question. Uh, there is a question. Uh, uh, however, Scopus and Science Direct Database are independent. Are they controlled by the same research in the very account? Um, yes, the short answer is yes. So any Elsevier database that you use, you can use the same registration information. So you can use across Science Direct, Scopus, Mendeley, um, any other of the of the Elsevier databases. You can use the the same registration. Yes. So the the coverage of each of those databases are different, of course, but um, the access to the database is the same. It is obligatory to uh, to be affiliated with a university or institution. Yes, it, it it is to be to have access to any of these databases. Usually, the subscription works via the institution. So the institution subscribes to Scopus, and then we make the Scopus available or the database available to the community of that institution. We don't have individual, it must be an institution. It can be a small research center, but it must be an institution, not an individual.
Um, how can Scopus be used to measure the impacts of research on society and public policies, particularly in the field of health, environment, and economics? Mm. It's a large so, question. Yeah. So at the moment, um, what Scopus is 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 showing is that it, it it shows also when your public or you can do a search in Scopus and also find out whether you are contributing to sustainable development goals. So this is available. Um, it's not perfect, though, I must say, because in, in Scopus, in the advanced search, if you go to the where the operators are listed, there's an option also for sustainable development goals. And you can see what research has you know, contributed. But we're using, um, because these searches are so large, they, you know, the search strings of different keywords linked together are, are pages long, and it's difficult for Scopus to, um, you know, to capture all of that. So at the moment, we are using the 2020 definition um, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the the, the keywords were updated afterwards, um, but that's um, only available in Cyborg now. It's just because it's computational; it's difficult to show. But you can still find a contributions towards this, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is to some extent, it's a proxy um, for societal impact. Um, and the other way of, um, of that we try to help researchers also capture societal impact is, is that we, sh we, we link where we can find a policy document, so where your research has such had such an impact that it has been translated into a policy. Um, we also show that um, within Scopus. So an example would be, um, oh, let me think of something. Um, uh, nutritional and child, or nutrition and child mortality you know something like that so that's also in public health i'm um, just to i'm not sure i can find an example quickly but if you would go to a a document it's on the document level that we show that we can't show that on an institutional level yet it's difficult to aggregate them um we have it available in cyval but not in scopus yet so if you open this document these authors will be able to see whether their publications have been linked to policy by going to view all metrics so it's captured under um, metrics and then under the metrics it's let me see if I can find one they would usually have the policy documents if it was um, captured by our policy documents but it's under the plum x metrics um, and it's on a individual research so you can see policy citations right so this publication um, has been cited by policy organizations um, and this also gives researchers some idea of how relevant um, their research is uh, for the you know the larger society so at the moment, this is what we don't have very specific metrics on societal impact, but we try to capture these kinds of proxy <coughs> that will that will that will also give a sense of um, the societal benefit of of publications. I hope that is helpful. Yes. Uh, there, there is two. There are two questions about uh, affiliation. The first one, uh, person asks you to show to show him how to change the affiliation institute. institute. Um, yeah. Try it, but uh, he had a list, so he asked to show that you can show show him okay. that. Okay. Okay. The second question about affiliation is: Can we publish why affiliated? to two institutions. Can we put both names in the affiliation case? Yes, yes, you can, you can. So let me just answer the first one first. Um, so uh, the person said that he wanted to change his affiliation. 
So yeah. you need to first go to your affiliation after your author profile. So just as this is a random author, and now I will go to edit profile. And in the edit profile, there's an option. Um, I'll just say, no, I'm, good. I'm somebody else. But where it says current affiliation, you must have more than one option here, right? So you can only choose between options. You can't put in something new. Uh, you can only, if scope is already captured that you are publishing at University A, University B, Institute C, then you can select which one of them is your home institution. Um, and you can select one, for instance. Um, so you can only choose between options. Right? Um, so that was the first question. The second question was, um, can you use more than one affiliation? I just want to show you an example of most researchers, uh, mature researchers do that. So you will see if you open a, a publication, just as an example. So um, now each of these researchers are at different institutions, but you will often see um, a researcher and he has an affiliation A and affiliation B, and then the both of them will be listed. So that was, I was just trying to find an example, but I, I couldn't find one quickly, but yes. You can use both your affiliations or three or four or five. Um, and when you do that, each affiliation will get credit for your, for your publication. So if you're working at a specific university, but you're also working at a research center somewhere else, you can use both affiliations when you publish. Sure. If I have got a profile on research, for example, what is the added value to get another profile on Scopus? So you cannot actually do that because Scopus automatically creates your author profile. There's nothing that you can do to create an author profile. The only thing that you can do is you can edit your profile. Um, so you cannot add anything also to your profile that we don't have already got in Scopus. Right? So it must be um, your publications that are in Scopus index journals, for example, will automatically be pulled into your author profile. And what you can do is you can make sure that your author profile is correct in the sense that one of your documents wasn't linked to another author profile. Um, but you cannot create another author profile. You can create an author profile outside of Scopus, like in ResearchGate or in Google Scholar, you can create a profile there and they will capture some of your articles that are not in Google, that are not in Scopus. Um, or could also captures um, some of your author, some of your, you know, some of your publications, or you, not, it doesn't capture it, you have to link your publications to author, to ORCID, and then you have a, a profile uh, with all your publications linked to them. But most of these systems, you have to register, you have to create your profile, and then it will link publications in Scopus, Everything is automatic. The only thing you can do is you can edit. So I hope that I hope that answers the question. Okay. There are some questions out of uh, scope. They are not the subject of uh, uh, today's webinar. Uh, so, uh, um, someone is asking about the possibility that Scopus gives to him to change his name, his name in the previous publications. Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good question because what happens is that um, Scopus when um, you have an author profile, I'm just going to go to the author profile page. And basically the algorithm captures all your different name variants, right? Let me see if I can see anything here. Um, 
um, yeah. So it will also, it will, you know, in the back end of Scopus, the algorithm will also capture other names that look similar to your names and it will put it under potential author matches. So for this author, they, there's none, right? So, but in some cases, it, you know, it captures all of the different name variants that you have. So it doesn't actually change your name. But it doesn't ch it change your name in the previous. It just makes sure that all of those publications that were published under a different name is also pulled into your author profile. And then if it's all pulled into your author profile, which it, it does automatically, um, um, then you can then you can edit your profile and you can select which one of those names you want to use as your um, your also profile name. Uh, but but that's all that's all that you can do. If your name has changed and Scopus is not tracking or not pulling or not linking your publications that are in the different under the different names, um, then you have to use the the then you have to use the support system. Um, so you go and, and you have to make a query. So you go to the support center and you message them and say, you previously published under a different name. Scopus is not picking up those publications. Can they please merge your two profiles? There are questions yeah. about how to access to Scopus for those who, who are viewing only the review. Uh, the review. Uh, donc, pour accéder, uh, donc, il n'y a pas une version complète de Scopus une, ou une version abrégée. Si vous uh, vous êtes affiché preview, c'est-à-dire que vous n'êtes pas connecté à partir d'un endroit autorisé. Vous pouvez vous connecter directement uh, en utilisant la, le réseau de l'université de Yelcom ou la faculté. Et toutes les universités, les établissements d'Yelcom sont déclarés auprès des Zévir. Donc, une fois que vous vous connectez en utilisant le reste de l'université, vous accédez à, à Scopus, à toute la base de données, euh, ainsi que toutes les autres ressources. Si euh, vous n'êtes pas sur le campus universitaire ou là, sur votre euh, euh, l'établissement d'Yelcom, vous pouvez utiliser la solution d'accès à distance mise en place euh, par euh, nos équipes. Euh, donc, euh, vous pouvez désormais créer euh, votre compte euh, d'accès à distance par vous-même en utilisant euh, votre email institutionnel. Je vais vous mettre euh, sur, euh, sur le chat le lien euh, pour ceux qui n'ont pas encore leur euh, compte d'accès euh, à distance. Je vais vous mettre le lien du formulaire pour créer votre, votre compte et vous pouvez utiliser. Là, vous aurez le, les deux options pour accéder à Scopus. Option sur Campus, sur campus, campus pardon, à partir de votre université et option à distance, là où vous êtes en utilisant vos identifiants. Donc... Euh, euh, Lucia, thank you. Je suis désolée pour euh, toutes les questions que nous n'avons pas pu prendre, euh, mais euh, nous avons fait le tour des questions posées. Euh, donc, euh, je vous remercie. Je remercie Lucia pour euh, sa présentation et pour le temps qu'elle euh, octroie toujours aux questions et euh, sa patience. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Glad you. that Thanks, uh, you would uh, here with us uh, uh, today. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> Hope you will be there next time. Uh, so uh, thank you again. Uh, merci pour tous les participants et uh, on vous donne rendez-vous la semaine prochaine pour un autre webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Lucia, please, I just will put the link to the. Uh, uh,
Donc, voilà, j'ai mis, euh, mis le, le lien vers le formulaire de création de compte. J'espère que vous allez le voir et l'utiliser. Et euh, merci encore et à la prochaine. Thank you, Lucien. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.